first question you might have for me is, what's a supercomputer anyway? And one way you can start to think about this is to think about your desktop or your laptop that you have at home. So that computer probably has one, two, maybe four processor cores. Well, the supercomputers that we have at NERSC have over 100,000 processor cores in them. And um, we, the scientists uh, from around the country use these computers to do their, their research. Now, you can see on the slide, they, I've got two pictures of our computers. One is a Hopper after um, computer scientist Grace Hopper, and one is named Edison after the inventor Thomas Edison. So oftentimes we have scientists come and ask, or people come and ask us, well, how do you measure the performance of your supercomputer anyway? And you know, the, the thing you should got to remember about supercomputers is they're really good at doing math, right? That's what these computers do. And so they do calculations. And um, so I put a couple example calculations up on the board, and we call these floating point operations. And they're floating point, that just means they have a decimal place, because we want to have really precise calculations. And so if I could do one of these calculations per second, we would say that my supercomputer had a performance of a single floating point operation per second, okay? But we know the supercomputers have a, are a lot faster than that. And so if your supercomputer could do 1,000 calculations in a second, it would be a kiloflop computer. If it could do a million operations in a second, it would be a megaflop computer. A billion calculations in a second, a gigaflop computer. But where we are today, those two supercomputers that I showed you on the previous slide, Hopper and Edison, they're at the petaflop level. That means they can do a million billion calculations in a second. But what's even more fascinating than that is the demand from our scientists we can't even keep up with. And so we are trying to build a supercomputer that is a thousand times faster than petascale, which is exascale computer. But I'm actually not here to talk to you about how powerful these supercomputers are or even the great science that's done on them. I'm here to talk to you today about supercomputing's big problem. Does anyone know what that might be? So what happens when you're sitting at home, you're typing on your laptop, maybe you have shorts on, and after a while, what happens? <laughs> your, your supercomputer or your laptop starts to get hot. Right? And there's even a name for this. <laughs> there's a syndrome, and it's called toasted leg syndrome. <laughs> All right. Now, if you imagine that a laptop is capable of doing this, can you imagine what a supercomputer with 100,000 processors is capable of? And so what do you do in uh, your laptop? You're running it for a while. What happens? A fan comes on to help keep it cool. Well, we have fans in supercomputers, too. And these are a couple of our fans. These fans are about this big, and they blow the air up through these cabinets of processors to keep them cool. We also use another technique, which is called liquid cooling, because it's actually more efficient to cool these computers uh, with liquid than air alone. But you well know that if it's summer and you turn your fan on or you turn your air conditioning on, what happens at the end of the month? You got a big power bill, right? And so that's what is computing's big problem right now, is the power and the energy that these uh, computers are using. But this is not happening to centers like NERSC alone. This is affecting the whole computing industry. And so these um, uh, Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, they're all facing the same problem as we are. And so I want to quantify the magnitude of this problem for you. And so I, I told you that our supercomputer, Hopper and Edison, these were about a petaflop uh, scale computers. Well, a petaflop scale computer draws about a megawatt of power. And if you run a megawatt uh, power continuously for a year, your power bill will come out more or less to about a million dollars a year, which is a lot of money, right? But you know what's even more money is I told you that we are trying to build an exaflop computer, which is a thousand times faster than Hopper or Edison. So now you are like, okay, I've got to do my calculation. I've got a megawatt. I'm going to multiply that by a thousand. That's a gigawatt? I'm going to have a gigawatt computer, and in today's dollars, that would be a billion dollars to operate a year. 
And so I can tell you that's far, far above our budget of our center <laughs> to run at all. So we've got a major problem. We have this huge demand of uh, computing from our scientists, but we'll, we will not have the ability to power these, these computers. And so I want to bring uh, one technical graph to you today. And if you're from the Bay Area, you, you might, have heard of, um, might have heard of Moore's Law before. And what Moore's Law stated was that every two years, the number of transistors in a chip would double. And so from the decades, for the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, the way Moore's Law played out is that these transistors, they got tinier and tinier and tinier, thinner and thinner and thinner. And what you saw from this was your single processor got faster and faster. And this was great for scientists. It was great for you as a consumer, because you bought a new computer, and your application automatically went faster. But something happened around 2004. And what happened is that these transistors were getting so small, so thin, that they were unable to dissipate the heat. And what the hardware designers realized was that instead of making one processor really, really, really fast, what they could do was have two processing cores, run them at a lower frequency, lower means slower, okay, and have more per, double, over double the performance, but a lot, use a lot less power. And as soon as they realized that they could do this for two processing cores, that quickly became four, it became eight, and now you can buy a, a, a processor that has you know, tens of processing cores. And so, you know, what are we doing about this at Berkeley Labs to provide our scientists more energy efficient computing? Well, what I'd like to do today is um, announce and tell you about our new supercomputer, Cori, that will be coming online in 2016. And the Cori system uh, will be a much more energy efficient system because the processor used in Cori will have over 60 processor cores on a single chip all running at a, fairly, at a lower uh, clock rate, at a lower speed. And so what we're able to do in this case is use all these little tiny processor cores, but in having so many of them, we're able to offer scientists uh, more powerful supercomputers without increasing our power bill. Thank you. Right.